Hello and welcome to another episode of Twimmel Talk, the podcast where I interview interesting people doing interesting things in machine learning and artificial intelligence. I'm your host, Sam Charrington. It's been another exciting week here at Twimmel headquarters. Just a few days after hitting the 500,000 listens mark, thanks to you once again, we learned that at least a few of those listens came from a certain Mark Cuban. And yes, I mean that Mark Cuban. Speaking at a conference in New York City, Mark mentioned that he turns to this very podcast to learn about and keep up to date on advances in artificial intelligence. Mark, if you're listening, we love you, man. Thanks for the shout out. The CNBC article that covered Mark's talk and mentioned this podcast focused on his fear of AI and what it might bring in the future. As you might imagine, this is a topic I've got some opinions on, and I respond to the article and Mark's fears in this week's newsletter. If you're not already receiving it, head to twimmelai.com slash newsletter to sign up, and I'll make sure you get the current issue. Last week, we announced the first of two winners for our Artificial Intelligence Conference ticket giveaway. Winners received a bronze pass to the conference, which grants access to all keynotes and sessions. Our second winner is Richard S. from Brooklyn, New York. Thanks again to everyone who entered the contest. If you didn't win this go-round but would like to join us at the conference, use the discount code PCTWIMMEL for 20% off of registration. We'll link to the conference in the show notes, which you can find at twimmelai.com slash talk slash 43. The first Twimmel online meetup was last week and was wonderful. The focus of the meetup was the CVPR Best Paper Award winner, Learning from Simulated and Unsupervised Images, through adversarial training by researchers from Apple. The idea behind this paper is this. Consider a problem like eye gaze detection. You've got a picture from, for example, a cell phone camera, and you want to determine which way the user is looking. Generating labeled eye gaze training data is hard and expensive. Generating simulated eye gaze training data sets is much easier and cheaper though, and can be done, for example, by using something like a video game engine. The problem is that the simulated eye gaze images don't look close enough to real images to train a model to work effectively on real data. This paper proposes using a generative adversarial network to train a refiner model that can make simulated eye gaze images look like real eye gaze images while preserving the gaze direction. Thanks again to community members Josh Manella who did a great job presenting this paper, and to Kevin Mader for walking us through a TensorFlow implementation of the model. You guys are just awesome. We're working on getting the recording posted for those who weren't able to join us live. If you're signed up for the meetup or the newsletter, you'll be notified when it's available. If you'd like to join the meetup, head over to twimmelai.com meetup to register. Next month's meetup will be held on Wednesday, September 13th at 11 a.m. Pacific time, and we'll post the details of the program shortly. Before we get to the show, I'd like to give a shout out to our friends at wise.io at GE Digital for their sponsorship of this industrial AI podcast series. Hopefully you caught last week's show featuring Josh Bloom, Vice President of Data and Analytics at GE Digital. We had a great discussion about how to incorporate physics-based information into machine learning models, among other things. For more information, you'll find that show at twimmelai.com slash talk slash 42. And for more information on wise.io at GE Digital, visit wise.io. And now for today's show. If you've listened to any of the shows in the Industrial AI series, you've undoubtedly heard me mention our friends over at Bonsai. I'm super grateful to Bonsai for taking the lead in sponsoring both the Industrial AI Podcast Series as well as my paper on that topic. Well, today's show, which concludes this first season of the Industrial AI Series, features my interview with Bonsai co-founder and CEO Mark Hammond. Our conversation centers on the role of what he calls machine teaching in delivering practical machine learning solutions particularly for enterprise or industrial AI use cases. I really enjoyed this conversation with Mark, and I know you will too. And now, on to the show. All 
All right, everyone, I am here at the offices of Banzai with Mark Hammond, the co-founder and CEO of the company. Mark, welcome to This Week in Machine Learning and AI. Thank you for having me. Happy to be here. Yeah, I'm super excited to have you on the show. Folks who are regular listeners will know the name Banzai without a doubt because you guys have very graciously sponsored my research into industrial AI and the podcast series. And I'm really looking forward to digging into with you what, you know, what industrial AI means for Banzai. But before we dive into that, why don't we, why don't you spend a few minutes telling us a little bit about your background? Sure. So my background is actually originally very technical. I started programming very young and ended up working at Microsoft while I was still in high school on Windows itself, Windows 95, and the first many versions of Internet Explorer. So definitely hands-on coding on the products themselves. Oh, wow. My passion, though, has always been artificial intelligence. So even while I was there, I knew that was what I wanted to do, and I decided to pursue a course of studies in computation and neural systems at Caltech. So I was working at Caltech, I'm sorry, working at Microsoft, attending Caltech, and it was great in all regards, other than that it happened in the late 90s, which was a fantastic time to work at Microsoft and uh -huh. like not the best time in the world to be in the field of AI. <laughs> it's like, it's like one of, part of one of the AI winters. Uh -huh. And so I found myself when, uh, when I was completing that, that, those studies kind of faced with, well, how do, we, how do we use all this stuff in the real world? And at that point in time, it was really, well, do you pursue a course in, in, in academia, right? Is that, do you right. go the academic route or, or w w what else do you do? Because it's part of the AI winter. And so I kind of decided at that point that because I have this strong impetus towards applying this technology in, in real world scenarios, uh -huh. if I wanted to do that, I was going to need to get some of the not purely technical skills. And so, okay. I, so I decided, okay, I got to go try product management, developer sales and marketing, et cetera, et cetera. You know, so I, I pursued that course. I, I did find myself at one point back at Microsoft, this time in sales and marketing. I was one of the developer evangelist who was was uh, out pitching .NET when .NET was brand new and getting everyone on the C-sharp bandwagon. So, oh, that, wow. was, that, so that, was a, <laughs> that was a lot of fun. And fast forward to today, and the market is now in a great place where the technology is very capable. It's the right time to start looking at applying these technologies to our real-world industrial and commercial enterprises and looking at those use cases. And I had come to the insight which led to Bonsai. And it, it was born through having gone through the academic track, having gone through the pure business track, having looked at trying to apply AI in lots of different contexts, and ultimately coming on one very simple realization. It's one of these, one of these things where you, you look back and you say, well, that seems obvious in hindsight, but until you think about it, it's not apparent. Mm -hmm. And that's that no matter how good we make these algorithms, they could be as good or better than humans at learning we will always have to teach them. You have to teach them something. It's a learning algorithm. It's kind of by design. It has to be mm. taught. And there wasn't a huge focus on how you actually teach something. We spend so much time in this field focused on, on the machine learning algorithms themselves that teaching is often an afterthought. That was the spark that said, look, if we're going to be able to solve these real-world industrial AI applications, the subject matter expertise, the ability for people to define what they want to teach and how to teach it, that is an area that is ripe for enabling the technology to be used. And that's what led to founding Bonsai and us sitting here today. Awesome. Awesome. It's interesting that you came across that realization. I, I tend to find the same thing, that the emphasis is, is on kind of the machine learning. And you know, maybe put another way, the way people tend to think about this teaching process is just throwing a bunch of data at That's an algorithm, right? Exactly. I guess it's kind of analogous to like throwing a bunch of books at a kid and expecting them to learn on their own, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. The one the one that I often use is it was with my son. He's learning how to play baseball. And and I tell people I don't take him out to the backyard. He's five, right? So I tell people he's five. I don't take him out to the backyard and throw fastballs at him because that would just be, <laughs> that's just cruel. Why would you do that? And yet no one even pauses for a moment when we're like, well, we're just going to throw giant data sets at these machine learning algorithms. And I bet if I threw a million fastballs at my son, he'd figure it out eventually too. But it's just not a very efficient or effective mechanism for teaching. So yeah. yeah and probably be pretty painful for your son. <laughs> true. True. <laughs> not, not very responsible for me as a parent. <laughs> yeah. So maybe we can, I guess we let's just dig into this. So what, when you talk about 
you know, machine training, what does that mean? Or machine teaching, what, is it, what does that mean to you? So machine teaching really boils down to actually looking at the art and science about how we teach things, distilling out the abstractions that are there, and then providing the appropriate platform, tooling, et cetera, that developers, we've, as we've, we've come to expect, in order to be able to properly construct the solution to a problem in that context. So that's at a very high level, but at a concrete level, what it means for us is we need to give you a very formal way, because it's still a computer program at the end of the day, mm -hmm. we need to give you a very formal way to specify what it is you're actually trying to teach and how you can go about phasing that teaching in a way that follows, again, using the examples we were just talking about, you, you don't want to have it be just throw massive troves of data at the system. Right. How you teach it can be broken up in ways that facilitate acquisition and mastery of these concepts you're trying to teach. So really, at the end of the day, it's about empowering developers to work as teachers and giving them the ability to do that in a very formal, structured way. You can think about it, if we're doing this in very humanistic terms, you talked about textbooks, right? Mm -hmm. So a textbook has a curriculum that's set out in it. Here's the table of contents, all the concepts we want you to master. We're going to go through it in this order. Here's phased problem sets that ramp in difficulty level. You go through all of these different ways of structuring the textbook in order to try to help guide students as they learn things. We do the same thing. We just do it in a very formal, structured way. We give you an actual programming language where it, there's no ambiguity about you know what you're trying to do. It's, it's less freeform textbook and more, much more program that, okay. you're, that you're creating. Maybe you can make that more clear by walking us through an example uh, of, sure. you know, pick a use case and maybe talk about how you would apply this to the use case. Yeah, absolutely. So if we look at a robotic system as an example, so you have a, an industrial robot, perhaps it's a, a robotic armature being used in a manufacturing setting or a warehouse setting, mm -hmm. and you want that armature to be able to create, conduct various pick and place operations. Maybe it's doing a, a palletizing operation, something of that nature. Mm -hmm. Now, when you want to have the piece of equipment learn to accomplish this task, you can break it up into the constituent concepts that matter. It's not about, I want you to perform the entire task, let me demonstrate it for you. Right. It's about, okay, you need to understand the concepts of moving between points. Here is where you're currently at in space. Here is the target you need to get to. How would you drive the motors to get to that that target. That, that would be an example of a concept. Now, for a concept like that, if you're looking at a commercially available industrial robot, there are very good controllers for that kind of thing already, right? Mm -hmm. they, they've got the inverse kinematics all worked out, and they know how to do it not just efficiently and effectively, but in a way that's going to maximize the lifetime of that equipment. You don't want to unnecessarily drive it too quickly, so you're going to cause it to fail faster than you'd want. Real-world concerns when you're using these kinds of robots. Mm -hmm. But then when you get to a grasping concept. So now we need to actually grasp the item that we're going to be picking as part of this action. Mm -hmm. uh, that is much more complex, right? And mm -hmm. you have to deal with rigid bodies and soft bodies and different packaging materials and all these different kinds of aspects that come to play. Teaching the nuances that go along with that, that's where you can start to take your subject matter expertise and really bring it to bear. There are people within all of our organizations who already know a lot about these facets of things, and they're not programmers per se. They're, they might be a mechanical engineer. They might be a chemical engineer. It, might, it depends what kind of problem you're tackling. But they know a lot about that area. And so if you ask them, if I asked you to teach a human to do this, what would you do? What would you actually, what were the, what are the concepts you'd want them to learn? How yeah. would you show them those things? What, how would you test whether they got it right or not? You, they usually can tell you actually, because that's their field. They, they know that pretty well. Right. And so we just give them a mechanism to capture that. So in the, in the context of grasping, for example, since we're just walking through one yes. of these use cases, you might say, well, actually, if I'm teaching a human to grasp something, I've got to rewind a lot until back when they're toddlers, right? But what do you do? You use large-scale gross motor skill objects. You get them really close to their hands. You have set their hands on it mostly. And then you let them go through the motions. And you... It's hard to think back in many of these cases for these very simplistic motions because mm -hmm. to us it's simple, but if you watch children doing it, they have to learn too. But you'd break it down, and you literally break it down into those kinds of things where I'm going to teach you gross motor skills, I'm going to teach you in these simulation environments so that you can experiment frequently, and you learn these concepts related to grasping. So you learn the concepts related to grasping, you're leveraging the pre-existing concepts related to moving between points, 
you want to teach concepts related to stacking or placing, orientation, valid grasps so that you can orient parts in appropriate ways for fastening them, et cetera, et cetera, all these kinds of things that happen when you're doing real-world industrial robotics, mm -hmm. you can break the problem down. You break it down into these constituent concepts. You design a plan for how you want to teach it. Typically, that will involve some simulation environment in conjunction with some real-world physical environment. Uh -huh. And then you define what that curricula looks like to teach it. And then because you've done it in that way, the system can proceed to try all the various areas that it can explore to, to teach how that works. And mathematically, if we're looking at the low levels on the math, all that's really happening is you're constraining the state space the system needs to explore. That's what, in practice, that's what's actually happening. But it's happening in this more naturally expressed way that a subject matter expert can readily latch onto and, and work well with. So that's that's an example in in a robotics context. If you look at uh, example, well, let's not go too far because there is so much yeah, in, in sure. that example to unpack. Sure, I think the first thing that jumped out at me was you kind of describe these two different types of concepts. One that you know a lot about, and you can help me refine this language. And another that, you know, you need to teach more abstractly. So, for example, you know, in moving, you know, in kind of the, the macro movement of the robot arm from point A to point B, you know, it's a well understood problem. You've got the inverse kinematics you mentioned. Yeah, I get the impression that, you know, we've talked a lot in this series about kind of reinforcement learning from a, a research and academic perspective. And one of the you know, the problems are, are, I think, in that domain, not decomposed in this way. And so I think what I heard you say was, it'd be kind of crazy to like throw a bunch of data and like have the robot try to figure out on its own the best way to move from point A to point B yes. when, hey, we've already done that for yes. years yes. and years and years. And we've spent a bunch of time perfecting the way to do that. So you know, part of what I hear you talking about is kind of is an idea of modularity. Yes, uh, agreed. In, in these approaches, that yeah, I'm trying to like get at a whole lo a lot of stuff at once. Sure, you no know, problem. One, one thing that I want <laughs> us to dig into is like, you know, compare, contrast. You know, what you're doing with you know the way some of the things we've talked about on the podcast, kind of academic approaches to reinforcement learning, and so one is this idea of modularity. Another is you know, maybe kind of elaborating on this this idea of constraining the state space in a way that is easily expressed by humans. Like yes. I think constraining the space the, the state space is a huge part of, you know, this process, even from an academic perspective, but my impression, not being an academic and, and at the sure. head of this field, but my approach is or my sense is that their approach is constraining the state space mathematically, right, as opposed to conceptually. Is that fair? That's fair. At the end of the day, it all does boil down to a mathematical constraint. It's just how you enable people to express that. And by virtue of building a system where you're expressing it in this more natural way for a subject matter expert who's actually working on these problems, mm -hmm. you can get at the underlying math by allowing people to express it in these more natural terms. Perhaps an analogy here would be would be useful. If we look back at old programming systems, right? So mm -hmm. in the in the late 90s when I was at Microsoft, Visual Basic for building desktop apps was everywhere. People mm -hmm. used that all over the place. And it was very popular because it enabled people who had subject matter expertise, you know, I'm running my veterinary clinic, I'm doing whatever it happens to be right. to build the applications they needed they cared about because they didn't worry about com interop capabilities and all these you know low level stuff they worried about can i build a form and can i put the right components onto the form that i care about and tie that back to a database in a way that doesn't require me to go become an expert in assembly language and low level binary interface mm -hmm. technologies this is the same kind of thing it's about building the right abstraction at the end of the day and so even if what our technology is going to do, our, the Bonsai platform itself, is going to take all this code that you've provided and it's going to compile it. And yes, at the end of the day, it's a big mathematical constraint. It's not that fundamentally the technology is different somehow. Right. It's the same. It's just that we're allowing people to express it at an appropriate level of abstraction where it's now framed in the context of the subject matter. It's framed in the context of right. the business problem you're trying to solve. And that's very powerful because it takes it so that you're 
data scientists can still play the role that's appropriate for them to play. Your programmers can play the role that's appropriate for them to play. And the subject matter experts can participate and actually teach it the intelligence that you actually want the system to exhibit. Typically, what we find in a lot of these environments is if you have true, deep expertise in machine learning and data science, mm -hmm. that is its whole own field. Right. All right? And that the people who have that, and if you look at the intersection with the people who have the expertise in building manufacturing equipment or optimizing supply chain facets, rare, right? It's very rare that they, right. that they overlap. So we have to provide, as an industry, we have to provide a way to enable all of these disparate skill sets to work together. And we have to focus on the skill sets that are already within these organizations or we're never going to solve the real world problems. Mm -hmm. And so that's... That ultimately is, is where we're getting at with this technique. Yes, it's about decomposing the problems, and it's about decomposing the problems in a way that allows the subject matter experts who know about all the different facets of the use case they care about to really come in and say, I need to teach you about this. So if I look at, look at real-world examples, we're doing a lot of work with Siemens at the moment. Uh, as a, as a, they're one of our customers. And if we look at their manufacturing equipment that they come to us and they want to talk about, adding intelligence to. I'm an expert at platforms and artificial intelligence and all this stuff. I'm not an expert at CNC milling, right? That's not, that's, <laughs> not my, that's not my area. But when they come to us and they say, well, here are the real world problems we face when we have these gigantic pieces of manufacturing equipment, and they can have an expert get on the line and they can, that expert can say, well, you're going to need to understand this facet of friction compensation and so on and so on. And, and you know, areas that I know th nothing about frankly, as at, on a personal level, but they can tell us all sorts of things about that, and we can work with them to say, all right, well, how do you go about this now? How would we break that down into something we can measure, into a set of concepts the system can learn? And it's not about how do we, t how do we craft a, you know, a PID controller to, to solve this problem, which would be a traditional way to solve this problem in, in an enterprise context. It's about how can we tell whether it was correct or not. So this is where the reinforcement learning part comes in. Mm -hmm. You don't have to be able to specify the controller at a mathematical level. You have to be able to assess whether the behavior was what you wanted and the ability to break down that behavior into components so that you can assess for each of those constituent components whether or not that was what you actually wanted. So elaborate on that. Do you, I mean, ultimately in these use cases you're trying to, are you trying to create the controller or are you saying the controller already exists and you're trying to identify the right parameters for the controller? Or are you trying to say the controller and the parameters exist and you're just trying to do some kind of validation? So all of the above, actually. We okay. run it. We, <laughs> unfortunately, the, the answer is that we see all of these scenarios. So okay. there are cases where what you have is that you have a, an existing controller and what you're looking to do is to identify deviations, right? Mm -hmm. So you're really trying to figure out when you've deviated and you have some condition that was not anticipated and you want to be able to deal with it appropriately. Mm -hmm. So that's something you definitely run into. There are areas you run into where you have existing controllers and you want to en enhance the capabilities of those controllers mm -hmm. beyond the already well-defined characteristics. So you run into that as well. And then there are areas where you people are still operating things by hand. So it, it is not uncommon. We can look at CNC machines, right? And we were just talking about them. To have expert human operators mm -hmm. manning these machines because the value to the business that is using them and creating the part, let's say you're, you're making a large-scale aircraft part, right. that part might be a couple hundred thousand dollars right. just for that one part. Right. And it might be a week-long operation to mill that part. Right? right, you're not going to just turn it over to your G code script and let it run, you're, <laughs> and you're going to have someone there to make sure everything's going as you expect. If you if there's a mistake at, on day two, you want to stop it on day two, right. so that you're not wasting tons of time and money as you're going through that. At and, the same time, one of the things that I hear over and over again is that there, you know, from the perspective of trying to apply kind of modern, sane you know, business and engineering practices to some of these industrial em environments, a lot of what the subject matter expertise is, 
is, hey, when I hear this machine kind of sounding yeah, sure. an octave or two higher in pitch yes. or something like that, I know that, you know, we're probably going to lose a bit or we're going to probably damage the part or something like that. Yes. There's a lot of a lot of art in addition to the science. How do you how do you begin to capture all that? So that's that's actually an excellent point. So the beauty of the modern machine learning technology is its ability to detect nuances there where the human expert, the subject matter expert, can say, yes, I hear it. And when it sounds off, mm -hmm. then I know this is about to happen. And you can say, well, what are mm -hmm. you listening for? And they're not experts in acoustics. They're not going to sit there and tell you, well, it's exactly this is the kind of sound. Right. <laughs> it's more like, well, I, just know what, I just know what I'm listening right. for. I've heard it before. And so the traditional mechanism would be go through, label a data set, et cetera. And you can, you can still do that. There are techniques you can use in simulation as well to model those environments. But in practice, the benefit you get from modern machine learning technology versus expert systems, say, if we go back to the 80s, yeah. is this flexibility. So if I can use another analogy, which might be intuitive to, to a lot of people, if you play a sport and you really enjoy playing that sport and you practice and practice and practice and you get good at it and someone comes to you and they're like, wow, you're really good. What is it that you're doing? What am I missing? So that I, I want to be good at this sport too. Right. Oftentimes as an amateur, you don't know. You're just, I just practiced a lot. I, I got good at it. And if you go to a professional coach or a professional athlete, they can tease it apart. And they can say, well, actually, when you were doing this motion, you'll note that you arced in this way. And you know they can get into all the subtleties and the nuance. That's why they're a coach right? or a pro. And so humans as a a learning system, if we look at ourselves as learning systems, <laughs> we have this remarkable ability to be able to exhibit intelligent behavior mm -hmm. regardless of our ability to explain all of it, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And modern machine learning systems are like this. So if you take a deep reinforcement learning network, neural network kind of approach, and you apply it to a problem, and you say, here's the correct behavior, just look at it over and over and over again, mm -hmm. whether that's because it's getting acoustic data and it's listening and you, you're telling it whether or not the part was about to break or you observe that the part broke and now it's learning what the subtleties in the acoustics are so that it can have that same sense that the expert operator did, mm -hmm. it can do that, right? That's one of the benefits of the technology. Right. But the more you know about the problem itself, it enables you to decompose it into those bits. And so you're not forced. You can always use the technology and get it to the point where, again, you're the the amateur athlete and you you just learn because you practice so much mm -hmm. or in, in the industrial case i have my system and it's actually monitoring the acoustics off of the equipment and it's learning to detect what it sounds like when a part is about to break it can do that that's fantastic but then if you have that subject matter expertise and you can really decompose the problem you can get a lot of benefits because you can teach faster you can now have the predictions that are made explained so that the system can make more nuanced and more accurate behavioral decisions. Mm -hmm. And really getting that subtlety and nuance allows us to build and capture more knowledge and build more sophisticated systems. It's kind of like with expert systems, you are totally rigid. Here are the rules. Right. I'm going to infer all this behavior. It's and powerful in that sense, but very constrained. Right. It was not very flexible. And now the pendulum has swung the entire opposite way <laughs> or all the way at the other end and you have your machine learning systems and it's throw lots of data at it and it's going to learn to predict something and great it's it makes great predictions but no one knows why right right so before right. totally explainable completely inflexible now totally flexible not explainable and by virtue of using a machine teaching approach like the one that we've outlined it's no longer black or white you get this nice continuous gray area if you don't have a lot of that you can provide, the system can still learn, and that's okay. The more of it you provide, the more explainability you get, the faster it can learn, the more nuance you can add to the, the decisions you're making. And it, it just opens that up. And that's so that it really allows us to tackle these problems at whatever level of subject matter expertise, explainability is appropriate for what you're trying to do. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what I think what I just heard was, well, you talked about explicitly the spectrum, but when a company is using your tools and building, you know, building a solution based on it. They've got the ability to, you know, you can start by at the highest level by throwing lots of data at the problem and not 
building, you know, building constraints into the system or, you know, conversely, you know, articulating the concepts, you know, breaking down the concepts mm-hmm. that compose the system, you know, or you can do that to some varying degree of detail. So it sounds like that's probably one of the kind of architectural design decisions of someone that's implementing this, like how much decomposition do we yeah. need to go to? And is that, what are the factors there? Is it primarily performance? Is it? Actually, it tends to be very iterative. So typically, okay. typically what ends up happening in a, in a real life engagement is they will first start with the simplest possible model, which is there's only one concept and I just having, I'm doing the classic reinforcement learning thing. Mm-hmm. Here's the environment for you to go explore go explore it. And that might be a robotics environment. It might be a supply chain simulation. It, it could be any number of things, mm-hmm. but just, mm-hmm. just explore and see what you can figure out. Typically that will learn something, mm-hmm. not as much as one would hope, but, right. but, but <laughs> something. And then you say, okay, well, let's see what would happen if I taught it about this. And so you add some conceptual block into the system and you mm-hmm. break it down into teaching that. And it may or may not help. It's not always a given that it helps. Oftentimes we'll get feedback from people who are more on the academic mindset Mm -hmm. of the whole point of deep learning was to get away from specifying these things, right? That that was the whole point. Why are you doing this? What happens if the person specifies this model and they're wrong, right? One of the benefits of deep learning is that it's not reliant on our presupposed conception of what the model should be. How do you cope with that? And, And for us, it's like, well, that's beautiful, actually, because when you start to break it down and you decompose the problem and you do it in this iterative way and you see whether that supports faster learning, whether it supports better explanations, better reuse, better generalization, all these different factors you might want to optimize for and care about, you learn about your own model. And so if your conceptual model is that friction compensation is super important for this manufacturing process, Mm And you go through the motions and you see that, well, the system's learning to make predictions and it's compensating just fine, but all the things I taught it that I thought I knew aren't being used. Mm -hmm. And the system can come back and tell you this. It's, well, you taught me this concept and in fact, I never use what I learned. Mm -hmm. I'm always doing something else. That's instructive. That tells you, hey, this model I thought made sense. There's something better because the system has learned the correct behavior and it's not using what I do. And, and this happens at all levels of granularity. So in practice, it's this iterative process. People start at the very simplistic model. They start to add more and more of the model that they believe is correct. It's very rarely a, here is the 120 concept model that I think maps to the problem I'm trying right. to solve and I'm going to go build the whole thing in one, one go and, mm-hmm. and go from there. It's, it's much more of a iterative refinement an expansion of the model so that you can have more nuance covered and more subtlety covered and learn about your model in the process of doing that. Okay. And one of the things that you guys talk a lot about is the the notion of explainability. Yes. You, you just went into that. Very important for customers in this space for a variety of reasons. I don't think I previously understood that it's this granularity of defining the concepts that really gets you the explainability. Yeah, right? absolutely. Can you elaborate on, on that? Yeah, absolutely. So there are a lot of techniques that have been published about how you start to peer into the, the neural networks and right. try to tease out what is, what is actually going on. You've got Lyme and A-Lyme and all. There's, right. ton, there's tons of these things. Our approach is different, as you said, because we're, it's, it's not magic in our system. It's not like we're going to have some amazing new way to peer into the neural network and tell you what this these group of neurons meant right right that that's not what we do what we do is we say we're going to let you break it up in this way and let's it's always easiest to to frame these things in in real world scenarios Mm -hmm. so let's say you are building a a supply chain logistics system right and you have got your real world data so you have all the telemetry coming from that you have simulation models that you've built in some discrete event simulator or something like that. So you've got all these all these different facets you can pull on. And the model that you use takes into account very coarse things like the weather and mm-hmm. seasonality of goods and perishability of goods and, and all these kinds of things that, are, that you might care about. And you might have more fine-grained concepts that you're teaching it about the composition of your fleet 
you know, and the land routes that are viable for you to follow and so on, like all these kinds of things. So, you, you know, you can teach all of this stuff. What's important to emphasize here is that it is very rare for a company that we work with to come back and say, and now we're turning it all over to this automated system we trained. Go. Right. <laughs> that's, that doesn't, like, yeah, that's still, there's not a level of comfort there yet. Right. What happens is there's still a human, and the human analyst is sitting there and making the ultimate decision, and they're using the system to provide decision support. Yeah. And in that context, if you've built, I don't care how sophisticated it is, if you've built a very elaborate neural network, or maybe you used some other machine learning or AI technique to build a system, and it comes back and it says, I think you should have truck 17 which is currently in Hoboken, depart now, go, right? That's what I think you should do. Right. The analyst is going to sit there and look at it and say, why? Yeah. Like, okay, that's nice that you tell me that. <laughs> and I understand that you have this visibility on massive parametric space that I'm not perhaps aware of as a human. Right. But, right. but I'm still not comfortable with the fact that I have no context into why you're telling me to do this. That truck is only two-thirds full, and you know the next truck that can hit that location is not available for two days. Mm -hmm. Okay, I, I don't think that's a good call. Whereas if the decision support system comes back and says, I think you should have this truck leave now, and I think you should have it leave now because... And then it frames that prediction in the context, again, not magic, but in the context of all these concepts you've defined. Mm -hmm. That was your own model. So you as that analyst who is sitting there and presumably is either very familiar with that model or part of defining it are going to look at that and have some rich context to say, oh, right. So we taught it about these overland routes and it sees that there is a storm coming and those routes are going to be cut off. Mm -hmm. And that's why it's telling me to do it now, even though there's not another truck for two days, whatever, you know, whatever it happens to be, mm -hmm. but it can frame it in that context. That gives you much more power and as an analyst to make that decision and confidence in the results. It's got an, you get your audit trail. This is why, this is why this happened. And so even if those models are, are not ground truth, right? It's not, this is not exactly the, the state of the world, but it is the model that you use to run your business. It is the model you use to drive your, you know, your robotic systems or whatever it happens to be. You want to have that level of explainability, and, and that's what you currently use to frame it. And so Fair it's enough. not we, – we're taking a lot of the magic out of the AI, but giving you the flexibility that you could have a node in there where the system comes back and it says, I think you should have the truck depart now. And everything in the model, I'm not using any of that. If you just use that model, the model would not say – make the truck depart now, but I've also learned by virtue of looking at all the real world telemetry and it, that I believe making that prediction now is a good, a good prediction. Mm -hmm. Then the analyst is going to look at it and say, well, I'm not really comfortable doing that, but let's look at what happens. Right. Let's see if that was in fact a good prediction that comes out. And that tells me I need to go back and enhance my model. My model is now deficient in some way. Mm -hmm. And then you can iterate. And you can keep working on the well, system. Well, and specifically deficient in its expression of these concepts. Yes. Right? It has a blind spot. Oh, a, well, it's Actually, blind spot isn't really the right way to say it because the model doesn't have the blind spot. It's the, it's the lack of decomposition. Yeah, you can't explain spot. it. It's, it's, right. it's like going to the human expert and saying why and having yeah. them say, I don't know. It's just this is the way I do it and it works, right? So yeah. humans have this interesting... I'm a student of human nature as well. And humans have this interesting facet where we conflate the ability to explain something with the ability to justify something. Mm -hmm. And so it's it's important as you look at these systems and say, well, are you actually explaining why you, you chose <laughs> to make this decision and that's really what happened? Or are you just looking at what happened and now you're justifying it? Uh -huh. A lot of times it's it's the latter. It's not the former. Mm -hmm. uh, that's human nature and that's just that's just the way we are. But when it comes to industrial AI and, and really applying this technology, you really want it to be the former. And so in certain circumstances, you want to go back later and leverage the human strength, which is to say, system predicted I should do something that was out of the bounds of my model. Mm -hmm. There's a gap, assuming that it was the correct behavior. Then there's a gap. How do I try to fill that gap? And then your ability to justify 
and come up with creative explanations for what that might be. The ability to have your data scientists dive in and really tease apart what happened and try to refine that model becomes very powerful. Mm -hmm. And so it, it is a very fluid process. It is not a write once, run forever proposition. It is a write many times, continually refine, right. and learn as you go along and get more, get a greater and greater and greater ability to explain what is actually happening mm. as you go through that process. That's that's the nature of the beast. Mm -hmm. Yeah, one of the things I found in my research and articulated in the industrial AI paper was an emerging maturity model in the way people are looking at deploying AI in, in the enterprise generally, I think, but particularly in these industrial types of situations where it's just as you described, right? There's this fundamental issue of trust. Mm -hmm. And that trust is... I think multifaceted part of it is, you know, repeatability, part of it is explainability, there are a bunch of other factors. And as people are gaining this trust, the first thing that they want to do is, you know, point these systems at some process and some, you know, system and just have it help them monitor it and tell them new things about it and kind of surface new insights. And then as they gain some some trust that, hey, it's actually providing me interesting information, you know, maybe it should tell me what to do, right? Then they kind of flip the switch or, you know, allow it to optimize. And, you know, they actually, you know, it becomes a decision support system yes. in, in exactly. the way you described it. Exactly. And then there's this further, you know, stage, which is actually, you know, the next switch, which is just do it, yeah. you know, make it so, yeah. right? Just yeah. control. <laughs> and I'm wondering if you see that same progression among your customers and, you know, what are some of the other factors, you know, that compose, what are some of the most important factors that compose trust beyond explainability? So we definitely are starting to see some of that, but I would emphasize the starting two part. And you yourself described that there's an emerging, you know, capability maturity model that, that uh, people are using mm -hmm. as a factor here. And I would wholeheartedly agree with that. The, the state of the market right now really is, it's like it's 1995 all over again. And hey, the, there's this cool Visual Basic thing. Let's well, go try it out. <laughs> in this case, it's like there's this internet thing, and everyone's like, "Wow, I really need to do something about this internet thing." Yeah. But but a lot of people, the the maturity of people's ability to do that is all over the map, right? People don't even know where to start. They know right. it's important, and you have true deep experts who are doing it. And so we see all of that. Yeah. And as you engage with customers and they're looking at the maturity of their trust in these systems and trust in their own models and own systems they've built so that they feel more comfortable turning that over. We, we definitely see that. You can look at, as an example, autonomous vehicles. So we talked to, of course, lots of people about autonomous vehicles. It's a mm -hmm. hot area. And there was a period of time not long ago where no trust whatsoever in having the systems make control decisions. Mm -hmm. Using the technology for perception and identifying whether there's a bicycle on the road or a cow right. or something like that. Okay, we're comfortable at that level right now, right. not steering the vehicle. Right? Like, no, <laughs> that's not, not yet. And you see some of those organizations now getting more and more comfortable with that. Mm -hmm. But really, it, it boils down to how well-baked is, is the systems that you've built. They can be at the point where it is just you still want a human in the loop. Mm -hmm. It will get to the point where you want a human to validate what's coming out. And then, yes, you will get to the point where, frankly, you will have the system make decisions in an automated way. And you do that because there's now sufficient trust and confidence in the system that it's going to do the right thing, mm -hmm. that doing the wrong thing is now an exceptional activity. Mm -hmm. And they'll still make some mistakes, but it's rare. And when it does make a mistake, you can capture that and you can use that to further refine the system. So, yeah, I think that's a natural progression. We are starting to see that. But, frankly, at this point in time, the market is really all over the map. And so tons of experts in a room, we will run into that with a, you know, with some frequency and you get into the occasion where people are just dipping their toes in the water and everywhere in between. So it kind of depends on the particulars of the the customer and how forward looking they are and how much resource they have to allocate towards exploring various facets of what they can do. But by and for the large part right now, there's a lot of desire to have explainability, to have that audit trail, if you will, so that people can go back and, and test things. The more you get to automation, towards the automation end of the spectrum, the more people want to be able to look not purely at the audit trail, but in generalization. 
Okay. So if you look at control systems for robotics, which we were talking about at the beginning, am I teaching the right concepts such that it will generalize the behavior in many scenarios, not just the one I'm teaching it about, mm-hmm. right? So there tend to be more towards that end of the spectrum of trust and automation. So you, that's how they could perform their tests. It's I didn't just learn how to grasp in a way that is per- appropriate for this one task I'm trying to do. It's did I learn grasping in a generalized way such that if I present a variety of objects in a variety of scenarios, it will still do the right thing. And consequently, you see you see everything. You see, you see all, everything on the spectrum at this point in time. Mm-hmm. Just to follow up on that last comment you made about the generalization, I imagine that's got to be driven by a, a business driver. Like You don't want to have an overly generalized system because that's going to be more expensive than you, what you need to solve your problem. A hundred percent agree. So, yes. Uh, yes. Do you find, I don't know what the question is. <laughs> well, no, so you're, you're totally, you're totally accurate though. If you have, let's just keep it in the same vein. It's easy to continue yeah. with that example. So robotics. Okay. So right. I have my robotic system. What I have it doing, it's been retooled. We are a part of a, a chain of its manufacturing chain. We just recently retooled for this chain. I really care about this one operation. I need to attach these two parts of whatever we're building. That means that the grasp has to be in a certain orientation because it's only viable to connect the two things if it's I'm not covering up the part that needs to be <laughs> right. that needs right. to be combined and so on. All these kinds of things, mm-hmm. uh, and they're that's what they care about. They're really focused on that because that's what they're manufacturing right now, and that's what's economically effective and efficient and capable. And if you look instead for the person who manufactures that piece of robotics equipment, right? So mm-hmm. I have, I'm ABB, or I'm, right. I'm a, you know, you pick your robotic manufacturer of choice. Right. I make robotic armatures. I care a lot about the generalization because right. for me, having it work with my, my, my customers in a variety of contexts helps them go faster. Right. And so, th- so that's kind of the breakdown yeah. we tend to see now. It's, and then it's, I think, I, I imagine... It also goes back to this idea of customer and market maturity, right? Mm-hmm. So, you know, my first few projects are going to be like proofs of concept and things like that. Yes. And I'm trying to solve this thing quickly and see if this is a viable technology. But at some point, you know, project three or four or something mm-hmm. like that, I want to, I really want to understand that, you know, if I'm going to invest in an approach or a platform that it can solve a broad swath of problems because there's real cost to totally. that investment. Totally, and and that's uh, that's exactly what we see. So it is a typical engagement for us at the moment would be to have a we have an, an early access program that we're actively working right now, and customers coming into that almost always want to run a proof of concept, as you said, mm-hmm. uh, as a first stab. We want to try to make it as aligned with the ultimate production use case as is appropriate, mm-hmm. but also appropriate duration and so on, so that it's a the spend of of resource and people's time and, and money is aligned with pinning down exactly what you said. Is this technology something that makes sense for what we're trying to do? And as people get that level of comfort, then yes, then you get more into the, okay, now let's expand the scope and we're doing a much broader use of this technology in the production environment and so on. That is a progression that we see time and time again. And I think that's that's true. That's not just true about us. I think that's true about the this technology in, in these industrial contexts in general. Mm-hmm. You know, we talked a little bit about about reinforcement learning and, you know, in some of the examples you gave, you know, you start high level problem, you decompose it into concepts, you know, it, you know, if the concept is like a leaf node, you know, somewhere under there, you're doing reinforcement learning to kind of figure out that leaf node if you don't already have a well understood model like inverse kinematics. Yep. Help us understand the, the relationship between what you guys are doing in the underlying reinforcement learning stuff like are you you know, how are you how are you architecting the sure. you know, the networks how are you you know training them yep. are there you know any particularly interesting things that you're doing to you know ensure that they're quickly trainable is there any academic research that you have based your approaches on like what are the things that you think about in, sure. in that interface sure sure that's a that's a there's a lot of depth that we can get into there. So so let me, <laughs> let me start at a high level so we can frame everything and then we'll, I'm, I'm happy to push down. So okay. at a high level, the, for Bonsai's platform in particular, the best way to think about it is in relationship to a database. 
So mm -hmm. when you are building industrial or commercial enterprise application X for your company, whatever it happens to be, and it's going to work with data, you're going to use a database almost certainly. That's a very mm -hmm. common thing to do. And what is the database providing for you? It's providing that level of abstraction so that you are not focusing on how this data is split across disks in the cluster and when you re rebalance tree structures for searching and all this kind of like the, right. all that stuff the database deals with for you. Uh, and it gives you this nice abstraction so you specify the structure of your data and the kinds of questions you want to be able to ask of it and, and it can take care of the rest. Our platform is very analogous to that, very similar. Now, of course, our abstraction is around this machine teaching stuff and, and so on. But in principle, when you're working with these simulation environments, when you're working with real-world equipment and telemetry, you are nonetheless interfacing with all of those systems, and you have to manage them. So if you're building a system and you're going to go through the actual training motions, and let's say it's a, a supply chain logistics system, and you have a discrete event simulation model of that system, and you want to train primarily on that before you bridge to the real-world telemetry data just so you get quicker learning and more repeatable learning, then you have to manage those simulations. And those simulations, depending on what you're doing, those can run very quickly. In some cases, if you're doing a computational fluid dynamics simulation, that can run for hours or days. And so managing all of that becomes something that matters. And so in the same way that you don't worry about data spanning different disks in your cluster on your database, we don't want you to worry about, am I running 10 copies of my simulation environment and where am I running them? How do I reconfigure them between runs so that I'm maximizing the efficiency of the learning? Mm -hmm. All of that is the kind of stuff that our platform manages for you. And so in that sense, there's a lot of low-level plumbing infrastructure stuff that is really valuable because you don't have to worry about it and it manages that for you. But then when you dig down, okay, so, with the, so that's, that's the high level. Now we'll dr drill down a level. Great, I've provided this really... I mean, but that's interesting stuff because at some point, you know, someone's got to set up, you know, models and actually train them. Yes. And, uh, you know, have that stuff all automated, you know, out of the box is a lot of work that someone doesn't have to figure out how to do. Yeah, and, and in fact, that's kind of the state of the art for a lot of this work. If you look at the academic literature and you look at deep reinforcement learning algorithms in particular... You'll find DDPG networks and TRPO networks and questions around whether you should have learner memories or not. And, mm -hmm. and is it an on-policy or off-policy method? Because if it, depending on which way it is, you might have to throw out historical data you've cached, given what you're learning next. And, mm -hmm. and this level of detail is great if you are focused on the mechanics of the learning. And from our perspective, it's the kind of thing you shouldn't have to worry about if you want to focus on what you're teaching and how the system should be intelligent at the end of the day, what the subject matter expertise is. So, I, would, I would rather abstract all that and manage it for you. And so by, you know, abstracting and managing it for you, you know, when you kind of punch into the details can mean a bunch of things. It can mean, you know, actually we know about all this stuff and we know how to figure out which is the best thing. Mm -hmm. You know, and we do that, or it mean, can mean we really only do this one thing, and you only have one choice, and thus we've managed it for you. Sure, right? sure, <laughs> yes. So, so it's more the former than the latter, of okay. course, as you'd as you'd expect, <laughs> as you'd expect. You never know. No, no to, it's a totally <laughs> fair question. So, what does that mean in practice? And let's let's use analogies again because it makes mm -hmm. it easier to recognize. Uh, let's say you're teaching the system something silly. I want it to learn how to play tic-tac-toe. I pick tic-tac-toe in particular because everyone's played it and everyone understands if you're past a certain age that it's a pointless game because you'll never win, mm -hmm. etc. right? The state space is not huge for, for tic-tac-toe. There's a funny XKCD comic, actually, where, where he literally maps out the entire state space in the comic. Like, it, here is every position you can possibly enter and what the correct move is once you're in that Like, you can never, right? And you just okay. do it. It's, it's small enough of a state space you can do that. We'll link to it in the show notes. Yeah, <laughs> awesome. Perfect. I can give you that link. That's easy. And the thing that's notable there is if you were teaching that and you did it in our system, mm -hmm. part of what the system does when it's compiling and it's generating the appropriate underlying networks on your behalf is it will just run the simulation for a while. Mm -hmm. And it will collect statistics on what it sees. And if it's running tic-tac-toe, after it runs it a little bit, and, and this is not a, take a lot of wall clock time, it's just got to run a lot of iterations of the, of the, in this case it's a game, but it runs a lot of iterations of it, mm -hmm. it will see very quickly the state space isn't large. And consequently, maybe using a Q-table is a perfectly reasonable algorithmic approach to solving this problem. Wow. Q-table being? Q-table being a specific approach for building a, a, a reinforcement learning network where it's appropriate if you don't have a lot of options to 
The state space you is can not huge. The entire state if you space. can enumerate enough of it, okay, just a table is a perfectly reasonable thing to use. And I mean that's a oversimplification of a Q table, but but that's the general <laughs> that's the general gist. Yep. And fine, why not use that? That's an efficient system to use in this context. Whereas if I give it chess, mm-hmm. and you say go run some sample iterations of chess and mm-hmm. just see what's going on. Uh, it will very quickly learn that the state space is gigantic. It's huge. And using a queue table is not an appropriate choice in that context. You need to use a different type of network. And in fact, depending on how deep that network is and how well you've decomposed it, we might ta- have to have some pretty deep layers, layer stacks in that network to be appropriate. So that's one level of like how it decides which algorithmic approaches to use. It also looks at the kind of data that are flowing through. So if you're looking at chess, you can hand me the data as a, as a array. Mm-hmm. If I'm looking at a robotic armature, you might hand me sensory data, which is a, you know just a collection of floating point values for motor torques and mm-hmm. sensor detections and so on. And if I'm looking at an autonomous vehicle, you might be handing me visual camera data. Mm-hmm. Right? I could be you could be handing the system any of these things. Right. The appropriate network to utilize is completely dependent on that data. So if you hand me a visual data, I should be probably constructing an appropriately sized convolutional network, right? right? Exactly. It has spatial locality. If you hand me audio data, it has spatial locality in a sense, but it also has temporal locality. So I should be using different kinds of networks for that. And all these kinds of heuristics and ways of looking at the environment and exploring and looking at how you deconstructed the, the problem, they're all taken into account. And so when the compiler outputs at the end of the day, okay, this is the network topology we're going to use, this is the algorithmic structure we're going to use, et cetera, et cetera, that's what's informing it all. Mm -hmm. And on top of that, we we ourselves are a machine learning system, so it learns by virtue of having explored how to solve similar kinds of problems it's seen before, how to tune hyperparameters and all these other kinds of Mm -hmm. things. Again, levels of detail that the compiler should deal with for you, the platform should deal with for you, I would... I want to, if if we've done our job properly, it's much, again, going back to the database analogy, it's just like that. You don't have to tune any of those things. You don't even have to know what those things are or what they mean. You just have to be able to tell me what you want to teach and how to teach it, and we'll build something for you. Is it the most efficient thing that you could possibly have hand-tuned if you were an expert and knew how to do it yourself? Mm-hmm. Probably not. And that's why you still have database administrators and, and database experts who can go in and tweak all the... I'm going to look at the slow log and go modify the queries, and I'm going to all the things you do with databases. Right. Same thing for us. If you want to go in and you want to provide a node in the system where you tell us this is the structure, this is literally the topology it should be for, for this component, okay, we're not going to stop you. Right? That, that, that's fine. But if we give you the flexibility to decide where, at what level you, you want to do that, right. that's better. Because it now lets you focus on the right people on the right levels. Your subject matter expertise can be focused on what to teach and how to teach it. Mm-hmm. Your machine learning experts and data scientists can be focused at that level. And teasing apart when the networks are making predictions that weren't, weren't, didn't fit in your model and you need to now refine it, great. That's where I want them to play. Your programmers have their role to play. I need to integrate with all these simulation environments, and I need to have the telemetry data being tied into the system and so on. Every participant in this process has a role to play, and our job as a platform company is to make sure that they all have the right tooling that's appropriate for what they're trying to do and their their part in the process, and that we can have the discussion at the appropriate level. Mm -hmm. Is it at the level of the use case? Is it at the level of breaking that down? Is it at the level of the subject matter expertise? Or do we need to get down to the level of convolutional neural networks? Yeah, network architecture. Is there a spec sheet or... or is there a, a, an enumerated list of like these are the networks that we support and how quickly this, does that evolve? Are there limitations or? So it's continuously evolving. As you can imagine, as a platform company, we're always adding more. We do have documentation up on our, our website. So if you hit our main website. Uh, and so that's all there. Yeah, just link to the docs section. There's documentation down to the, the protocol level. So okay. I have my own bespoke custom simulator which we do run into with some frequency. Uh And I need to be able to tie this simulator to the platform. How do I do that? Right. So there's documentation on that. And so it just kind of, it depends on what level you want to get to, but yes, there's documentation all up online publicly available. Okay. Did you get asked by customers, like how many different network topologies or architectures do you support? And it does. Yeah, that happens. Sometimes it does. It depends on the, it depends on the, 
it's how technical machine they are learning and how depth that, that, yeah. that they've gotten to. So yes, we've had people ask that, and so we can talk about TRPO networks and DDPG networks and DQN networks and you know, all the different. We, I'm not, we don't have to enumerate them all right now, but yes, you can you can start to enumerate all the different yeah. ones that the platform has baked in, and have that conversation. You'll also run into people who have been rolling their own. So a lot of times the we'll get asked the question beyond which networks do you support. I was just going to ask yeah. you this question. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we'll get asked. Okay, we have been. We'll get, we'll get asked the question, well, who, who else in this space should we be looking at? Right. And really, there's two answers when it comes to deep reinforcement learning and applying that to solve these real-world problems. The first is rolling your own, right? That is actually, we run into that very commonly. Mm -hmm. And the second is very, very vertically specific company-focused areas, right? So mm -hmm. there are players in the space who only focus on deep reinforcement learning for supply chain, only deep reinforcement learning for robotics, et cetera, mm -hmm. right? So those are the kinds of things you run into. In the case of the latter, if the solution they have fits your bill, then that's, that's great, right? Uh, they have a very specific focus. We are a platform company, so we're looking to allow you more flexibility in custom modeling and how you expand all that out. So that it's just kind of a judgment call internally for, for where you fall on what you want to do. In the former, where you're rolling your own, which we run into all the time, mm -hmm. that's actually an, an, a perfectly fine situation for us because the conversation quickly becomes, well, how, how much time have you invested in that? Right. And have you run into this set of problems? So you'll run, in, <laughs> so you'll run into customers who they've decided reinforcement learning is the correct path to solve their problem. Yep. They've been going down that path and building out the solutions. They're spending a ton of time managing their simulations. They're mm -hmm. tonning and all these different asset facets of what we had just been talking about. Right. And we say, well, you know, we can. We're not going to magically make the problem that you're facing about crafting a, a good reward function go away. Right. That's part of. That's still part of the development process. You're going to have to do that. Mm -hmm. But we can take all the pain of managing those simulations off of your shoulders. Right. Like the platform can help you do that. And so you run into those companies that are a little bit further down the roll your own, and they're like, "Oh wow, I don't have to do this anymore. Mm -hmm. That's that sounds great. That, let me let, let's talk about doing that." And then you run into ones that are just dipping their toes in the water. They kind of say, "Well, I could just build. You're built on top of TensorFlow. Why wouldn't I just build it using TensorFlow?" And we can start to enumerate all the reasons yeah. why. But but generally, we can say, "And these are the problems you will run into." And some percentage of them will say, "I don't want to. I don't want to deal with that. Let's talk." And some percentage of them will say. I got to experience that myself. I got to experience it myself, <laughs> and that's fine with us because we know that you'll you'll Dad, come back. Throw the fastball at me, Dad. Yeah, throw yeah. the fastball at totally, me. <laughs> totally, totally, totally. Yes, exactly. You got to learn how to find the balance of where where it makes sense to roll yeah. your own and where where it doesn't. Yeah, and actually, I was gonna I was going to ask the question more aligned with kind of that last way you expressed it, and in particular, you know, TensorFlow is obviously a popular platform for this stuff like is it an either or no uh, it, it doesn't have to be at all in fact we have a feature that we added to the product recently mm -hmm. called gears and for the developers in the audience this is an interop feature and for people who aren't developers per se uh, it, it's what allows you to to bridge this gap right it allows you to bring your current investments that you've built whether it's in tensorflow or you built a perception model using opencv or whatever you happen to have done and add that to the system uh, facet of building any of a modern machine learning system, which is not just building the model, but also deploying it in a production environment. Those, there's actually completely separate problems you're going to face in those two arenas. And so you might have built these models but and want them to participate in the broader prediction pipeline. Right. And you can do that very easily in our system using, using the Gears feature. It'll, we allow you to, to add that in. So it's, again, going back to the, the database analogy, you don't have to if you have the, that expertise and you want to do it or you've already baked a bunch of things and you want to leverage them. Mm -hmm. We're not going to make you redo that work, and we're not going to stop you from tinkering with the lower-level pieces if that's what you want to do. It just becomes an option, as any good platform should. It's, we're going to give you the ability to say, I don't want to deal with any of that. Do it for me. Or I've done some of this and I want to add it. Mm -hmm. Or now I want to tinker with the low-level bits because I... I feel like I've learned enough and I'm an expert and I want to do that now. So you, you can you can play at any of these levels, but it's not an either or. In fact, if you bring a TensorFlow model to the, to the system, it integrates really well. Our system is built on TensorFlow, a TensorFlow-based gear. We can chain everything in all the appropriate ways. 
if you have a Python function that you've written you want to call out to, maybe you want to invoke a cloud API because you've made an investment in Watson or some other technology. Mm -hmm. None of these are barriers. And in fact, this is part of the way the system was designed. If we go back to the very, very beginning, and I talked about you have existing controllers that know how to do the inverse kinematics in it. Right. All you need to do is move your robotic armature between point A and point B. Right. You should not be teaching that. That is, right. the, And this goes to the academics, right? So you look at the academic papers. They're going to talk about how you teach all these things. And, and that's great because it's, it's talking to how we further and enhance the technology. And I love that work. That's mm -hmm. great. But if we're talking about practical real-world application, why? You have tons of work spent on building that, and you should just use it. And, and that's right. a very simple, simple example. But if you look at autonomous vehicles, the automobile companies have spent a lot of resource on building capabilities around assistive parallel parking and all these other right. things. Do we really want to go reinvent all of that? It, it, it seems kind of silly. We should just integrate that with the rest of everything else. And, and so, that idea extends to your cloud-based APIs, your TensorFlow models. Totally, totally. Python. That's right. That's right. It, it, it can't be a homogenous, this is the only way. Or, you know, that's not that's not practical. That yeah. doesn't work. Yeah. So this has been super interesting. Anything that you'd like to leave folks with? Well, I would encourage the audience to take a look at our platform. If they're interested in the early access program, of course, we would love to hear from you. If you have a use case that you think is suitable, we'd love to hear from you. But just in general, I would encourage everyone to start thinking about machine teaching, whether it's with us or not with us. The path forward for industrial AI in general is going to rely very heavily on the marriage of human expertise and machine intelligence. You need both. It's not enough to have one or the other. You need both. And so starting to explore in more depth how you're teaching the system. Don't just throw data at it blindly. Right. Don't, right. That, that's, that's level one, right? You need to move several levels beyond that. And so I would encourage everyone listening Start to think about that. Start to think about strategies for doing that, whether you're rolling your own or whether you're using a tool like ours. That matters a whole lot. And as practitioners using this technology, a lot of our job is going to be teaching. It's not going to be, over time, the tools will get better. TensorFlow will add more capabilities. Platforms like ours will become more prominent. All of these things will happen just as a natural evolution of the industry. And the part that will remain in all circumstances, no matter what, is how do I teach what I want the system to actually be intelligent about? And that's going to be with us forever. And that's very particular and idiosyncratic to our businesses and what we're trying to accomplish. So really start to think about that. That would be what I would encourage the audience to do. Great. Great. And we'll make sure we point folks to your website and the EAP and some of the other stuff we talked about. Sounds great. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. much, Mark. Yeah, thank you as well. I really appreciate it. All right. All right, everyone, that's our show for today. Thanks so much for listening and for your continued feedback and support. For the notes for this episode, including links to Mark and the various resources mentioned on the show, head on over to the show notes at twimlai.com slash talk slash 43. Please be sure to comment there with your feedback or questions. Thanks again to our sponsors for this series, Bonsai and Wise.io at GE Digital. I'm so, so grateful for their support. If you enjoyed this series, it would mean a ton to me if you took a second to reach out to them on Twitter to thank them for their support at, at Wise.io and at Bonsai AI. Don't forget to register for my newsletter at twimlai.com slash newsletter and for next month's online meetup at twimlai.com slash meetup. Thanks again for listening and catch you next time.